joined today for another, another Sunday worship service. God is good. You know, we just came out of a 10-year anniversary celebration on last week. And amen. And I'm still in it. I ain't at the party. Folk be saying they celebrate their birthday for whole months. I don't know where that come from. They, they got a birthday month. No, no, you got a birthday. But somehow we, we done shifted from a birthday to a birth month. So we celebrating Hope City for the whole month. And so I, um, I told the first service on today just, uh, and I've never really felt no, no uh, stress of not liking ministry anymore. Uh, I've been enjoying ministry, particularly been here. Y'all make doing ministry easy, Hope City. And it's so grateful for you guys. But just for the past two or three days, I've been feeling a sense, an overwhelming sense of just gratitude and just, I'm like a new fire for this church and for what God is calling us to do. And so I'm excited for the next 10, 20 years of, of what we're going to do together. And for those of you who wasn't here on day one when we started 10 years ago, here's the beauty of what God's about to do in this season right now. You're going to be a part of all the amazing stuff he's about to do in this season that we're in right now. You know, we've been having a, a, the overflow room has been literally been filled out every the last two or three Sundays. Uh, we had 740 people in this building on last Sunday. And so we're working. Amen. Y'all clapping. Now, you better keep on clapping when I say I need you to make room. Yeah, keep that same clapping going. When I say make room, serve, volunteer, come on, worship one. We need more help. Come on, y'all. We need help. Folk are coming, seeking the hope, seeking help. And obviously, people are getting what they need. Our second and third service is pretty much already full to capacity. We have a little bit more space in the first service. One thing that we're doing now, just an FYI, um, the marriage conference is to capacity. So that's full. There's no more room. It's 150 couples, which is 300 people that will be in our marriage conference in a couple weeks. Um, if we, there is an overflow or a waiting list available. So if you're still interested, still put your name on the waiting list. If someone falls off, we will add you to the guest list. But it's going to be an amazing two days of impartation, development, ministry, pouring into food, dinner, lunch, all that stuff, making this a date weekend for the couples of Hope City Church. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And I think what's happening here is people just, just is not coming here, and we designed it that way just to get a word on Sunday morning. Sunday morning is important. You guys come to here in the big service to get a word from God. But it's not what's happening in your life. It's not just the message you're getting on Sunday morning, particularly those of you who are in community serving on a dream team in a small group. You're doing life and in community. That's where healing and breakthrough and deliverance and all that takes place. You know, not just on Sunday morning. On Sunday mornings, everybody got their best clothes on, smiling. Everything is perfect. There's nothing wrong. But it's when you get intimately involved with what God is doing here at Hope City Church and you take the mask off. And you get real about where you are and what's going on. And this is how people are finding hope and people are finding help. So I would encourage you, if you're still dating Hope City right now and kicking their tires, now's the time to get in. Because God, I believe God has the answers that you need for your dream, your vision, your body. Maybe you're sick right now and need a healing. Maybe your marriage is going through. I don't know the specificity, the mountain or the valley you may be in. But I do believe that God is stirring the water in this ministry here, and people is getting help and healing exactly where they needed that. Do I got at least four or five witnesses here that can say, God is healing me in areas of my life that hurt. And one other thing I want to also say, please be praying for us. We know it's tight in here right now, but we're working on some different options. And one thing to put on your record, come the, the Sunday after Easter, we are launching another campus in Pooler. Yeah. Amen. So we'll give you more details on what that looked like, how you could be a part of that launch. Again, if you wasn't here when we launched this church 10 years ago, you can have an opportunity to be a part of what God's about to do in Pooler. I want to also add to that, um, folk are like, well, how's that going to happen? It's going to be the same experience. The goal is to make the experience in Pooler, downtown, wherever we plant a church, it will, be, it will be the same experience that you experience here. Because if I'm trying to convince people to go somewhere different, they have to know they'll get the same experience that they're getting here. And so as we reach out and build a launch team with people who's not a part of Hope City right now, there will be some people here who will go over there and help plant that location. And you know, who remember their, um, their grandmother who would get a flower and she would take a piece of that flower and break one off and put it in a little glass of water and let the roots start growing. And then she would take that and plant that somewhere else. 
That's literally what we're going to be doing, taking somebody out of the house and planting another location. Now, listen, when I ask some of you to go be a part of that launch, everyone will be able to raise their hand and say, you know what, I want to go for three months to help out, or I want to go and be over there for the entire time. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give everybody the option to make that decision, but one person. Anybody could raise their hand and go, but my wife. <laughs> yeah, could go. She can't go. Come on, somebody. <laughs> yeah, but everybody else, because it's bigger, this church is bigger than me, it's bigger than my personality. It's about the kingdom of God, expanding God's kingdom, and even God sending people our way for me to equip and empower who he has called to plant another church as well. So I'm excited about that, excited that we'll be licensing and ordaining a few ministers in our third service on today. So God is good, and so get along for this journey. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And I'm going to tell some married folks something right now. This is why the devil don't want us to get our marriages together, because he knows that God may want to use some of y'all. And some of y'all saying, well, leave me right where I'm at then. <laughs> I don't want the Lord to use me and none of that over there. No, he's going to fix that thing. He's going to fix it so good that you're going to go tell somebody else what the Lord has done for you. Come on, somebody. He's going to get you over your mountain so you can help somebody else get over their mountain. I told them earlier on today, I'm, I'm actually in my message right now. We always say that hurt people hurt people. But I, and, and that's true, hurt people hurt people. But God wants to heal some people on today. You want to know why? Because healed people heal people. Healed people heal people, and God is looking to heal some people in this season here so that you can do exactly whatever it is he has called you to do and he is desiring you to do in this season. We kicked off a series a few weeks ago from our um, theme of 2024 entitled Exceedingly More, and if you remember, we all talked about the more that we individually and personally want from God, but there was five words I shared with you as a church that we are believing God for in this idea of exceedingly more, more grace, more wisdom, more accountability, more discipline, and more favor. Now, we all rejoice and shout over when we say more grace, more wisdom, and more favor. But those two words, more accountability and discipline, are the two words we always run away from. And how many of you know that oftentimes it's the lack of accountability and the lack of discipline in our life that, we, that, that, that causes us not to get the breakthroughs that we are looking for? So today, I want to talk about holding each other up, a community of accountability. Holding each other up, a community of accountability. In a world filled with challenges and distractions, the idea of accountability takes on a deeper significance. And as believers, we are called not only to walk this journey of faith individually, but we're also called to do it in community with a group of people. You know, there's a scripture um, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 10 that says, Two are better than one. Why? Because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. And so imagine us being a church, a community, where we not only celebrate each other's victories, but we also stand as guardrails, guard posts, as pillars of support during times of trials. It's easy for us to testify what God is doing great in our life. We don't mind sharing that, but when we're struggling, when we're going through, who do we run to? Who do we run to and say, hey, my name is Corey, and this is my problem? God is calling us. The more that God is calling us to do as a church, we have to be, what, more accountable. I think about, for example, when we launched this church over 10 years ago, I didn't just have a dream and an idea that said, hey, I want to start a church and was accountable to no person. I took that and shared that with my pastor, my bishop, Bishop Davis, over 10 years ago, shared with him and our pastor at that time, Pastor April, what I believe, what we believe God was calling us to do here in Savannah. Did the same things with the um, elders of the ark, share it with them. And through prayer and direction, at some point, we all agreed. They supported, they agreed what God was calling us to do here in Savannah. But I had to be willing to submit it and be account accountable to someone else. But watch this here. Not only was I accountable to my bishop and also the overseers with the ark with that idea, I also told my wife. Because how many of you know, I wasn't going to move over 200 miles away and she did not agree. Come on, somebody. 
Uh, I wasn't going to move 200 miles away if she did not agree. And if she would have said no, I would have waited long enough until until God dealt with her, showed her, and gave her a yes. Now, some of you probably saying, well, but if God told you to do it, you should have done it. See, you out of order already. You, You don't understand the power of agreement. You don't understand the power of keeping peace in your house. Because if God really says something, if you wait and don't get weary and well-doing, you will reap. You will get the answer, the manifestation, if you faint not. Too many of us, we get ahead of our skis because we don't want to be accountable. We bust out and do stuff because we don't want no one else to tell us what to do with that thing. But I'm telling you, there is safety in accountability. I remember attending AA meetings with my dad over 20-something years ago now, and I often remember when we go to those meetings, and they'll be in the circles. And one thing they always had to do is stand up when they begin to share, is stand up and say, my name is David, and this is my problem. My name is Corey, this is my problem. Listen, you will never get help for the things you need to get help for in your life if you don't go through admittance. You know, you can go to the hospital all day, go to the, the emergency room. You first have to do what? Go through admittance. You just can't walk in and sit down and expect to be seen. You will sit there all day if you do not put your name on the list. They'll call everybody else's name out, and you will sit there and wait there all day. But too many of us, we come to church, but we don't go through admittance. When it comes Sunday in and Sunday out, we love the worship and the prayer. It feels good. We see everybody else getting their breakthrough, and we're wondering why we did not get out because we have yet to go through admittance. There's power in accountability. Exposure brings disclosure. I'm going to say it again, exposure. When I shed light on a thing, when I disclose a matter, it takes the power that the enemy wants to use over my life with that thing because exposure brings disclosure. You know, our theme for this year or our verse of scripture for this year is Luke chapter 12, verses 47 through 48. And if you remember, the last part of that verse says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. I don't know about you, but I believe that I am a much given person. I believe God has given me much. Matter of fact, I would go so far as to say that God has given you much as well. And again, to whom much is given, much more is required. Am I talking to much given people on today? A, 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 a much given marriage, a much given dream, a much given ministry. To whom much is given, much more is required. If you want a greater and a better, then guess what? To whom much is given, much is required. We always say the grass is not greener on the other side. I present to you sometimes the grass is green on the other side. It's just not your grass. Come on, somebody. It's many times the grass is green on the other side. It's just not your grass. And if you're willing to put in the work, you can get your grass green as well. Because I hate the fact when people always try to demean someone else's relationship or their business or their dreams. Well, well, ain't nobody that happy. There are some people that happy. There are some people that happy with their life. And oftentimes when we're not happy with our life, we try to demean and minimize what's going on in their life versus saying, you know what? They may got it going on in their life. I don't know how they did it. Let me go inquire because I want to get to where they are. Come on, somebody. And many times people get to where they are because it was the the degree of their willingness to be accountable to some one else. Not just the grace, not just the wisdom, not just the favor, but he was willing to be accountable and walk in discipline. I remember the story over here in Numbers chapter 13. You don't have to turn there, but Numbers 13 verses 30 through 33. It's a story where God had sent the 12 spies to spy out the land of Canaan that he had already promised to them, that he was already given to them. He said, go and spy out the land. 12 went and spied out the land. The Bible said when the 12 came back, 10 of them put up a negative and a bad report about what they saw. They said, we saw giants in the land. They are overwhelming. We do see the blessing in the land, but in that same land, we see giants who are much more powerful and greater than us, and we cannot take the land. And the scripture says that Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we are more than able to take the land. Listen, if you are not accountable for what you say out of your mouth, you could hinder a whole lot of people from walking into promised lands that belongs to them. 
Matter of fact, some of you, God promised you something, but your mouth, you were not accountable for the stuff you said out of your mouth and you talked yourself out of what God was trying to talk you into. God, God did not send them over there to see if they want the land to go consider it. No, he sent them to get a preview of what already belonged to them. And they talked themselves out of their healing, if you would. They talked themselves out of their breakthrough. They talked themselves out of the doors that God wanted to open for them because they focused more on the problem in the land versus the promise in the land. And you got to make sure you're focusing more on the promise in the land versus the problem in the land because the enemy wants to magnify the problem and minimize the promise. But I don't know about you. I'm magnifying every promise that God has for me, every dream God has for me, every vision for me. We are magnifying the problems in our marriages. We're we are magnifying the promises, the, the problems in our kids' life. We're magnifying the problems in our ministry. We're magnifying the problems in our community versus talking about what's going right in our ministries, going right in our community, what's going right in our marriages. I come to learn the more you talk about what's going right in your marriage, many times the stuff that's going wrong in your marriage will work itself out. Where, see, come says here, wherever, in the, wherever focus goes, energy flows. I'm going to say it again. Wherever focus goes, energy flows. Whatever you focus on the most, all your energy is going towards that thing. I remember we've been married now 21 years. And I'm telling you, I'll tell you before, we, y'all, we had our bags at the door pack, waiting for someone to say something stupid. Waited, waiting for someone to do something dumb. We were ready to get out of the mess. And we are a blended family. Many people did not even know that we were a blended family until over the last few years. That's just how well we blended. But it wasn't all that way out the gate. Because how many know you, you, you can blend and bleed? Our desire is, is to teach you how to blend without bleeding. <laughs> how to bring that thing together and no one gets left behind. But that was not an easy thing to do. There was a lot of pressure, a lot of bad days, a lot of heartaches, a lot of disappointments, a lot of, I'm going back to my mama's house. I ain't had no mama house to go back to. I ain't know where I was going. <laughs> I'm just leaving. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but we had to let somebody into our mess, into our, our pain, into our struggle, and let them speak into it. And how many of you know that when you expose your dark areas in your life, it's not comfortable to sit there and hear somebody talk to you about it and tell you why you did it? It's uncomfortable. But the more you shed light on those dark areas in your life, healing can come forth. You can get comfortable with the uncomfortable. I'm telling you, I remember a time we would have arguments left and right. We would we, we'll be battle, not battle buddies. Not battle buddies meaning like a good marriage group like y'all have. I'm, 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 I'm talking about battle fighting. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like a day, a moment, we both just woke up and realized we, we acting as stupid. We over here, as Pastor Rick said, in Stupidville, in Foolville, <laughs> fighting and going crazy over unnecessary stuff that was destroying the integrity, the foundation of the marriage. And this is why pride, fear, and shame cannot have the last word, because pride, Fear and shame will make you keep it in the darkness and don't let someone in on the outside to speak into the situation. And so a man or a woman is the right. I, I ain't telling nobody that because they're going to look at me different. And so pride and, and shame and, and fear will cause us not to share. We say stuff we shouldn't say. We put out words. We, we, we think thoughts. And Matthew 12, 36 says, but I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. And let's be very clear, that full accounting day, you know how you don't do a, a most people don't do a, uh, um, a full account, if you would, um, what's, what's the word called, with, 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 you do like a full um, a audit, audit. You may not do, a, do an audit every year, but most companies, every few years they do a full audit. Now, that's going to be the full audit, but how many know it's, it's an audit that comes every time you make a decision? If you didn't manage your money right and you want to go buy a house, 
and they run your credit, and you didn't run your credit, you didn't manage your credit right, guess what? The audit is, is going to say your credit's too bad. You didn't handle your money right. So now a house that could have belonged to you, if you manage your words right, your money right, I'm telling you, accounting days are coming every single day. And the question is, are you willing now to add value, add life, to deal with the negative words you are speaking? Why? Because power, life, and death is where? Many of you are living the life you spoke, be it good or bad. Many, many, many of your children are walking in the negative world. You're going to be just like your daddy. You're just going to be just like your daddy. You're going to be just like, and if it was a negative thing that daddy was like, or the power of life and death is in our tongue. We've got to reframe our words. We've got to reframe what we see and, and what we, we say. Watch this here. Our struggles are empowered in darkness, but accountability sheds light on that darkness, causing the struggles to lose its power. I'm going to say it again. Our struggles, our weaknesses, our sins, whatever it is, our struggles are empowered in darkness. Because for some reason we think if we keep the fact that we struggle with porn or struggle with alcohol addiction, whatever your thing, your thing may be, you think because you keep it in the dark, you'll be okay. No, the longer you keep it in the dark, it grows. And let me tell you something. I know what I'm talking about. Particularly when it comes to the area of porn. Let me get on the edge right here because some of y'all, like y'all never done it before. It don't, it don't go down. It don't get smaller. It increases. It magnifies. Because whatever you do in secret with no light, it grows. But it's only when you tell somebody. It's only when you expose yourself. Come on, somebody. See, see, some people want to expose you to bring you down, but God wants to expose you to bring you up. Come on, somebody. He wants to expose you for you to deal with that thing. I remember, and, and you may remember this better than me here. I remember maybe we've been here now 10 years. So let's say I remember 15 years ago being um, in South Florida at a couple's event, a church planting event. And the pastor of this church, at the end of this two-day event, he separated the wives. It was about 15 wives and 15 husbands. And the wives were with, with his wife, and we were with him. And I remember very vividly right now, all 15 of the guys, we are sitting by the pool at this hotel where this event was at. He pulled out a box at one point. In this box, he pulled out a box full of knives, daggers. And what he did was he passed one out to everybody that was at that pool. And he said this dagger, this knife represents, that's now in someone's hand, it represents everything they know about you. And that they have the power, if they want to bring you down, if you would, that they could stab you because they got everything. Listen, you got to have somebody in your life that knows where the dead bones are at. No, let me go back. You have somebody in your life who know where the living bones are at. Because if it's dead, then you're good to go. But those things that have the propensity to destroy, to steal, kill, destroy, and take away your life. We did this thing called on Mondays where we'll check in. They ask the question, how's the tide? And how's the tide means is the tide low or is the tide high? If, if the tide was low, that means you're doing good, nothing bothering with you. If the tide is high, that means something, someone is bothering with you. And we use the acronym PMS. He said, why guys using that acronym PMS? Yeah, power, money, or sex. Because it's oftentimes one of those three things, no matter where you are, no matter what field, power, you want more power, you want more money, or sex, whatever it is, those will be the three propensity falling somewhere in those three where the devil will want to bring someone down. And the question is, how's the time? Is somebody bothering you today? Is something bothering you today? What is, what's tempting you right now? And the thing that we learn that people will only share at the degree in which you're willing to share. And so oftentimes when, when I'm coaching people or counseling somebody, I expose myself first. I tell them one of my struggles or what I went through first because it creates an atmosphere where they'll say, you know what, man, 
is he willing to share his struggle, what he been through and what he did. Hey, you know what? They can begin to, to share and confess their faults as well. I'm going to give you two examples of being held accountable in the Bible. You know, one of my favorites is um, the woman at the well. And the woman at the well in John chapter 4, verses 16 through 19, it's this, this discourse going on where Jesus told his disciples, I must needs go through Samaria. And he had this discourse with this woman at the well about, about her life and what's going on. And she's shocked of who he is. He's shocked that this Jew is having this conversation with this Samaritan woman who's obviously getting water by herself because she didn't want to be with the other women. And so Jesus, in this discourse to her, they get to a point in verse number 16. He told her, go call your husband and come back. She said, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. He said, the fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you have right now, he ain't even your husband. You're talking about, now, Jesus being petty, y'all. Now, come on, Jesus. Now, you, you ain't had to do that girl like that. Now, you can talk about the one, the one she with right now, but you went way back. Come on now, Jesus. Jesus clapping back. Come on, Jesus. Like, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I present to you, he was not clapping back. I present to you, he was not being petty. I present to you, he was holding her accountable. He's telling her, what I'm about to do in your life, before I give you this miracle and this breakthrough, I want you to be aware of some of the stuff that you have been doing that is holding you back. And you think you got a sixth man right now. If you don't deal with some of that, it's going to be a seventh man and an eighth man and a ninth man and a tenth man. We think avoiding accountability makes things better. No, it can make things worse. And we avoid the pain of the difficult conversation at our own he said, yes, you're right. The one you're with right now, he's not even your husband. And she said, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Here's another one here in Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. It is God where he had already told Adam and Eve they have full access, full reign to the garden. They can do what they want to do. Touch any tree in the garden. that they. When you talk about a generous God, he, he, he free access. But he said, the only one you cannot touch, touch anything you want to touch, but just don't touch this one tree right here. And, you know, and that's like telling the kid, don't touch the hot stove. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Come on, y'all don't talking about the very thing you tell them not to do is the very thing they end up doing. <laughs> he said, you can touch any tree in the garden. You got full access to whatever you want. Just don't touch the wind. And then the devil whispered in your, our, our ear, and we think God is holding something back from us when he say, don't touch the wind. That God's trying to stop us from living our best life and, and, and being a baller and a shot caller. No, no, he's making sure by not touching that tree, you can be a baller, you can be a shot caller, you can achieve all the dreams and the goals you want to achieve. But in the day you touch that right there, it's going to steal all your dreams, all of your vision. God did not say don't touch that because he was trying to hold something from them. He said don't touch that because he was trying to protect them. And if you begin to see your life that way, when God say, don't do that, don't do that, let that go, be patient, be kind, be forgiven, when you get the understanding of why he is saying that to protect you, it'll make it more easier for you to respond accordingly. And then we get to the verse here in verse 9, he said, Adam, where are you? Adam, Adam, where are you? And he wasn't asking Adam where he was at because he didn't know where Adam was. He asked Adam where he was because he wanted Adam to know, Adam, you are not where you was. And I believe God is asking the question that, David, Sheila, Paul, where are you? He's asking a couple right now, where are you as it relates to that counseling? Where are you as it relates to that healing? He's asking a single woman right now who got a vision and a dream for a future, but she don't know how to be patient. And now she's letting any man walk in and out of her life. He's letting any woman walk in and out of it. He's, God asking the question, where are you? Where are you as it relates to that debt? Where is it you? Where are you as it relates to writing that book? 
Where, is, where are you as it relates to fulfilling the call that I called you to do? And for many of you, you're not where you are supposed to be. He said, Adam, where, where, where are you? And the Bible said, he said, I, I, his response was, I, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. I got a problem with that because Adam was always naked. He was always naked. So what's the difference of you being naked today than you was on yesterday? And then God said, who, who, Adam, who told you that you were naked? He said, you've been walking naked all your life, not being ashamed, not being embarrassed. But who, how do you know this that you should not have known? I, I was covering you. I was protecting you from that. Who told you you were naked? I'm going to say to my sisters real fast. And guys, y'all about to cross over too now because too many guys acting like women. We used to say, girl, you talk too much. Now you say, man, you talk too much. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Come on. Girl, you talk too much. Man, you talk too much right now. We sometimes, we talk too much. Adam, who told you that you were naked? Eve had a conversation with a snake. You got to be careful who you're listening to and who you're talking to in this season here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of y'all single right now, you're by yourself and you're happy, but you're still wondering. I'm about to say Lira, but I, I can't say Lira. Lira married now. So, you know, um, uh, uh, Bobby, I'm going to say Bobby. I hope there ain't no Bobby here. The girl broke up with Bobby. And she, and she see her friend, her friend says, hey, girl, I, I saw Bobby at the mall today. Oh, for real? Yeah, I, I saw Bobby at the mall. How was he doing? He was doing fine. Can we see by himself? No, he wasn't by himself. Who he was with? A, a girl. Or oh, must have been his cousin. No, that wasn't his girl. A girl. They was kissing. Oh, for real? They was kissing? Oh, for real? Can, can, did, did he look happy? Yeah, he looked real happy. Oh, for real? He was like, real? Like, like, more happy when he was with me or, or yeah, he, yeah, he looked way happier than he was. Oh, for real? <laughs> Now you depressed, you mad, you upset, because you want to know too much. <laughs> You're talking about too many details you don't need to know. See, women, real fast, women, men, we are projectors. Women, y'all are receptors. We put out, y'all are hold that thing. Men, 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 we put out, we're naturally wired that way. Even a woman's body is designed to carry. A man we're designed to put out. The only dangerous thing about a woman who is designed to carry is when you carry the wrong thing. Because even when you carry the wrong thing full term, it has the propensity to bring forth a birth to something. He said, he, he said who told you? How do you even know that you are naked? Who, 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 who have you been talking to? What, what? What have you been eating? Who told you that you were naked? Hope City, we can't get naked. We can't touch stuff that God tells us not to touch. We, we, we can't do things that God tells us. Not. I know we're grace, 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 grace world now. Grace, 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 grace. But we need both grace and truth. Because you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now, I know many of y'all join because Hope City because y'all love our message of grace, favor, and wisdom. But we are also a church of truth. We believe the whole scroll of God's word, the whole counsel of God is still true. It, it, it was powerful 2,000 years ago. It is powerful today. He's the same then. He's the same now. His word has not changed. Even though the culture may want to change it, he has the same standard today. And I know some of y'all let y'all mind, you already filling in the blanks on what that means, but that even means some of y'all, y'all, y'all dating couples up in here who have been dating for 50 years. You don't want to put a ring on it, but you want to talk about everybody else. I need security after this service on today because I feel the daggers, I just got daggers coming every way right now. We like to talk about the obvious things that we see that may be wrong but we overlook the stuff that we have normalized. That we've been normalized and said, well, if this is okay, 
but that ain't okay. Says who? Uh, 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 how you made your sin better than their sin? <sighs> okay. I only got six minutes, so I, I, I can't teach it. <laughs> to whom much is given, much more is required. We are a much given church, Hope City. And because much is given to us, much more is required. Watch this here. Much more patience. Much more long-suffering as we're dealing with God's people. You see, here's my problem with people who, 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 who think they know what God would do, with people who, who aren't living or doing things the way they want to, is that they want to pick and choose who can come to church. But I remember a scripture that says, let the wheat and the tail grow together. And the reason why I believe that, because sometimes when you think you, you're about to get rid of a tear, you're actually moving a wheat. You don't know where people are at in their walk. You don't know how God is dealing with people. So while you're judging and try to say who belong in the family and who don't belong in the family, God says, let the wheat and the tear together and let me deal with the separating. <laughs> Hence the reason why we, we, we say whosoever will, let them come. Let the Holy Spirit, let the God do the work on cleaning people up and fixing people up. Come on, somebody. That, that's not your job. Because thank God that he didn't kick me out in eight weeks of my deliverance process. See, see, some of y'all got saved and everything got right that one day. But, but for some of us, it was a process. We are the embodiment of work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Come on. So if you want to say, well, who, oh, the, those people over at Hope City, they all ain't saved. Oh, okay, and? Everybody in your house ain't saved. Come on. And it's just two of you. Come on. <laughs> Do the numbers or who ain't. <laughs> Do the numbers. But I'd rather for someone to come into the house of God and week in and week out and hear the word of God being preached. And you will be the first week, the sixth week, the sixth months, or the six years. But I'd rather preach the truth of God at all times and let the Holy Spirit do what he needs to do versus, versus shaming people. And then they go out and never get a chance to hear the gospel preach. It's the reason why sinners, they love to cling around Jesus. Because the scripture says it, it was with loving kindness did I draw you. You know, most of my deliverance work, it don't take place in here. It takes place in that counseling session in my office there. When, when I can really shut corn, get all up in their business, get all up. In, because at that point, you're giving me full access to come on in. Now, this sermon is blanket, is hitting you where you are. I don't know where you are. You've been on the top, bottom. you letting the sermon hit you where it needs to hit you at. But when you invite me into a private place and say, hey, Pastor Corey, this is my problem. I need your help with Amen. You're giving me authority, full authority, full reign to come in like a sledgehammer and knock that thing. Come on, somebody. Yeah. This is the reason why some of you also got to be careful that you don't speak in a place that you don't have authority to be speaking in. If a couple don't allow you in their marriage to speak at a certain level, you just say, hey, man, I'm, I'm praying for you. I'll be the best for you. I, it's it's going to be great. But don't be going up in there telling people, well, if you stay in that marriage here, God, if you leave him, God's going to strike you down. You don't know the details. She may need to leave. You don't know what's going up. You don't, they're not telling you the whole story. So you just simply say stuff like, I'm praying for you, I'm believing the best for you, you know, you just give blanket stuff. But when they invite you into the closet of what's going on, now you got details. I see too many people speaking about stuff you don't got enough details on to be speaking something on. That's the reason why I don't allow people to come a whole hour of my day and we dancing around the issue. No, what's the problem? We ain't doing tricks right now. What are we here for? Oh, okay, he did it or she did it. Oh, okay, oh, 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 both of you did it. Okay, got it. Cool. Because you, you cannot fix anything that you won't disclose. And we don't want to be, oh, man, it, I didn't need to be, be a two-part. This didn't need to be two-part. Not two-part, two-part. <laughs> My wife said, you know, she need to stop. <laughs> you in that urban school too long. <laughs> I'm getting you out of that school. <laughs> Getting you back to suburban because you done got urban out of here. She said, come on, Tupac, you know. <laughs> I was about to preach my sermon up here. Be dignified and you 
going hood on me right there. Come on, somebody. Come on. He's going. <laughs> I don't know how to land this plane, y'all. Now, give me some keys real fast. Give me some keys. Let me land the plane because we got a lot of people coming here in the second service. Can I finish this next week? Is yeah, this helping out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's finish this next week. Let's finish this next week. This could be a big old counseling session right here. If we just take what we hear, apply it, honor it. If, if you're a couple, go talk about it. And get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Men, get, 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 get comfortable. I'm telling you, there were times when the wife, she would talk about something. I'm like, God, we got to talk about that right now. I mean, just the thought of, honey, we have to talk today, uh, make me want to throw up. <laughs> like, oh, I feel nauseous. I mean, that whole day, I'm, I'm sitting in my stomach, like, Lord, have mercy. Here we go here. Get her on. Walking in the door, like going to a funeral. Okay, here we go. <laughs> here comes my death. <laughs> normalize hard, courageous conversations. My wife did something a couple of days ago, and you, hey, you probably remember this. I don't remember exactly what it was. I was laying in the bed, and I think I was watching TV, and you said something. And I responded like, okay, cool. I wouldn't normally respond that way. I would have gave some clap back. I might have to say something about that. But I was like, it's, it's cool, it's fine. I'm telling you, we got to grow up. Some little stuff ain't even worth our time and our energy. Learn how to say, yeah, boo, no problem. Go ahead on. Yeah, that's fine. Sure, no problem. If, it, if it's not going to break nothing and tear stuff down, because I, I hear too many guys saying stuff like, I'll, I'll, I'll die for my wife. I'll die for my kids. But guys, listen, she ain't asking you to die for her. Because if you, if you really would physically die for all she's asking you is stop screaming at her. Don't talk to me that way. So if you really would physically die for her, let's start practicing that death right now. By dying to the things that is hurt in her flesh. Whatever the specificity of that thing may be. And don't bring me that food in this world. Well, my daddy was that way, and my daddy, daddy was that way, and my daddy, daddy, daddy way. Listen here, the curse breaks right now. The habit breaks right now. The struggle breaks right now. You set a new course for you and your seed going forward-wise. And ladies, I ain't going to talk to you. I'll let Pastor T tell y'all what to do. And y'all know she know how to tell you what to do. He'll tell you what to do and give you a kiss at the end. I mean, can't nobody... Can't nobody cut you with a sermon like she can. I mean, but she, she cut y'all so good. I say one rough sermon, but folk walk out that door, don't even, even look at me. I'm like, ooh, that sermon must got under them, but that sermon got under their skin. But boy, she would preach a 45-minute sermon all cut the whole time. They come out there in the droves, they want hugs, they want kisses and stuff. And I'm like, she just told them about they self, and, and, she, and they just love it on her. <laughs> Listen, people want the truth. People are struggling privately, going through stuff. What they don't want to do is be ashamed, embarrassed, and feel less than and trash by it. But there are people struggling, and they are wanting help. And it's our desire, through the gospel, through the teaching of God's word, to make sure that we give you what we believe is God's word that can heal you everywhere you hurt. Let's give God a hand clap for his word. Thank you, Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today, for your word is a lamp to our feet.